very respectable. So um, I hope you won't mind that I will invariably take the six at the other end of this session as well. But um, first to, to Mike and Joe and Jez for, for organizing this and bringing us together. Um, it's an incredibly timely discussion and I think intersects with a lot of um, a range of different research interests. And I, for one, coming in in a discussant role, have been delighted to have the chance to, to read the papers. Now, um, for those of you who, who I don't know, I'm, I'm somewhat of an interloper coming across um, from the law faculty here at King's College London, um, where I'm a reader in criminal law, and my work has predominantly been on international and transnational criminal law, but very much from an ethnographic perspective, so I'm delighted um, to be part of this panel, which has the rather, I might say, wonderful title of Mars, Cleo and the Courts. Um, and so, um, so what I will do in terms of the structure is I actually want to take the opportunity to introduce all of our speakers. Um, each, um, we have three papers in total. Each paper will be presented for 15 minutes, which should then give us um, half an hour for discussion. I would encourage you to please put questions onto the Q&A. Um, um, box as well as raising your hand, um, because then I can feed those discussions, those those questions in and we can sort of sustain a response to the papers. Um, but let me start by just saying what a wonderful panel this is. Um, and let me introduce um, our, your, our speakers today. And this will be the order in which they will speak as well. First, we'll hear from Professor James Gow, who is um, very familiar to you as a, as a professor in the Department of War Studies here at, at King's. Um, and he'll be joined by his colleague, Professor Robert Hayden, who's a professor of anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh, writing on, on law and anthropology. And they'll be talking to us um, about a paper entitled Person Document, an after action report using being and becoming the ethics of expert testimony in the first international criminal trial. Um, and following from this, we'll hear from Dr. Ivo Vukusik, um, who is an assistant professor in international history um, at the Department of History and Arts at Utrecht University, and is also a visiting fellow in, in the Department of War Studies at King's. And Ivo will be talking to us about defense strategies of alleged perpetrators at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the case of Srebrenica. And then finally, we'll hear from, from Lena Raslin, um, who's joining us from the University of Law, London, and is a recent graduate of the MA in Conflict Security and Development Studies here at King's. And she'll be speaking to us on a, on a really fascinating paper that I very much enjoyed reading um, called Advancing Universal Justice in a Digital World, the Admissibility of Open Source Evidence in the Courts of England and Wales. Um, so that's where we're headed. Um, and without further ado, let me please hand um, to James and Robert. Uh, can I find the picture of Bob? No, that won't come up. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, I think I was taken rather by surprise there. I'm not Bob Hayden, though it will say Bob Hayden. I was trying to put Bob Hayden's picture up, uh, but we were expecting to have a break to sort out some technical things here. Eva and I are in a room together. Uh, so we're going to have to move ahead. Uh, in the, it, this is not properly a paper. It may well become a paper. We are trying to work on it. There hasn't been time uh, for me. And what I'm going to do uh, is read from something that Bob sent me, which set this going. Uh, uh, and after that, I'll turn to other bits of it. The idea... Uh, is an understanding of what it is to be in a particular position of being a witness, and in our cases of being the first witness for the prosecution, in my case, and the first witness for the defence in his, uh, in an innovative, you know, world, new world creating, big bang environment. Uh, and so I'm just a bit shocked because I have somebody else being presented as Nikki Palmer. I know I'm proposing as Bob Hayden, but that's quite strange. <laughs> I think I think the reason it's happening is it depends the links that we used to access yeah. the panelists. So, um, so Lena, we'll make sure that it's very clear that that's you. And James, I can clearly <laughs> see that that's you and not Robert. So, oh, yeah. yeah. 
Um, all right, so can I, can I jump in for a second with, with apologies. We did run over time on panel one um, and, and we don't want to disadvantage you. And we do have a lunch no, 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 right don't after. Worry. So. I'm just, I'm not, don't worry, we'll just move on. We're adaptable and flexible. We can pause for a few minutes though, if you, if you like. No, There's no, after. Mike, let, let's just move on. Okay. We're even further behind now. Um, so, um, so the idea uh, is to explore being a witness and the idea of the witness as document. Uh, what I'm going to do is read first from something that Bob sent me. He was asked to make a presentation at Pittsburgh and about a year ago he sent me a copy of what he'd written for that which was a reflection on the, on the experience and nature of being a witness for the defense. Um, there are four aspects to this, one of which is the reflection, which is more likely to be the end of the paper, but I'm gonna read it first in the interest of time because I can then adjust however long they speak uh, for, to the time that remains. Um, but the two bits I won't be talking about, one is being the conduit of documents. To be a witness is to be somebody who introduces material, documents of other kinds into the process, uh, who interprets, uh, and who is a, a guide in a way. And the second is what happens afterwards. Uh, I could point to instances, for example, the CMH defense uh, seeking to block the use of transcripts of my testimony uh, in, in later court processes, uh, or we can look to the way in which actually the narrative that was established through my evidence at the start ran right the way through most of the Serbian focused prosecution cases to the very end, uh, not, but with no need for my, to, my being there because the purpose for which I was originally there had been satisfied. Um, but I will look at the two ideas that I said. One, that kind of reflection on the experience and in an age of impact, yeah, if only the impact agenda had been around in the 1990s when we were doing this kind of stuff, uh, it, uh, we would have been uh, greatly celebrated. Um, and the second on the person document. So first uh, I shall read, apologies for reading. I never find it a good thing, but it seems the best way to represent something of Bob, seen as Bob is at the moment in Zenit, so doing field research uh, and can't get a connection to join us. Talking to people to inform them about making decisions can bring criticism. It can lead to personal attacks. Oddly enough, these attacks come from folks who at other times can accuse one of being in his case, complicit in war crimes simply by speaking on some topics and in the way uh, that he does. The Yugoslav and Rwanda conflicts led to the creation of the first international war crimes tribunal since Nuremberg, which leads to another issue, expert witnessing, to be or not to be, and especially one for the defense. The field of transitional justice has been a growth industry, spending lots of money and creating lots of jobs for lawyers from North America and Western Europe in particular, all to bring war criminals to justice and thus foster reconciliation. At least that was the theory. And in 1996, when the Yugoslavia Tribunal got going, the invocation of Nuremberg as an inspiration made it seem plausible. It's not very plausible now, but that's another story. Obviously, being an expert witness for the prosecution would generally be seen as admirable. Is there a link here to those stirring calls for anthropologists to be witnesses more generally? My problem was that I was called to be the first expert witness for the defense in the first war crimes trial since Nuremberg. The issue had nothing to do whatever with the crimes charged, but rather was jurisdictional and hinged on rather technical issues of Bosnian constitutionalism and laws. I did it. The defense attorney beat me down. My initial refusal, but, uh, uh, and he said, only, he only wanted me to say on the stand what I'd already said in print. I decided that the tribunal could not provide real trials if qualified witnesses could not testify truthfully for the defense in connection with legitimate issues. And I still believe that. But the same kinds of people who criticize one for trying to provide objective analyses and for speaking with people in government who are involved in making real decisions 
criticize one for trying to take an international tribunal seriously as a real court instead of as a show trial or a Kafkaesque process. At what point, though, do you ignore your own ethical principle rather than testify? In my case, turning away the fevers from Slobodan Milosevic's lawyers was easy and instantaneous and based mainly on my knowledge of how deeply responsible he was for the hardships of people throughout Yugoslavia. More troublesome was turning down requests from counsel for some Bosnian Croat politicians when I thought that I could provide information that could aid their defense and that they were being tried unfairly. That's where I found I'd been beaten down by the strident criticisms. I received for having been an expert witness on a technical constitutional issue in the first case. Sorry, I misread that, but I hope you got it, the sense. It seems that if you take seriously the position that defendants have the right to a real defense instead of only a token one, you have to be prepared to sacrifice your reputation and maybe much of the rest of your academic career. I couldn't do that. So let me bring these ramblings to a close. Heath Cabo, who invited him to uh, make the presentation in the first place, posed me these questions. To what extent are academic engagements around urgent, morally charged questions of human suffering grounded in humanitarian tendencies to intervene, respond, and save? And are such moral imperatives congruent with or conflicting with scholarly responsibilities toward accuracy, nuance, and reliability? I do not see how an academic can offer much of anything of value to the people and institutions responding to crises that is, that is not grounded on the scholarly obligations of basing analyses and thus recommendations on reliable and accurate data, analyzed without consideration of what might be considered the preferred outcome, preferred even, preferred even uh, the academic making the analysis. I should add, otherwise, what do we offer? that is not already provided. Uh, so, sorry, what do we add that's not already provided uh, by journalists who write better than most scholars do, or international humanitarian experts who actually have training and experience for these tasks, or propagandists for one side or another, secure in their faith that if not God, then human rights are so securely on their side that any contrary argument must itself be unethical. Or those morally driven folks who knowing nothing at all about a region still know all that is important to know about a crisis. But then, how could we access, uh, assess all the likely effects of actions without adhering to scholarly responsibilities and principles? And in that, uh, I'm going to conclude by going back to, to one little bit. Uh, to Weber, and I think it's an important idea to understand. Okay? In all of this, uh, this is Bob, but I would share this, I was able to draw on the thoughts of others who had faced such dilemmas, which are not new. Weber's classical lectures, Science of Vocation, and Politics as a Vocation were published after his unsatisfactory experience as support staff to the German delegation of the Versailles negotiations. So what we have is a sense of people trying to go with the evidence, whatever that evidence is, whatever it shows. Uh, and uh, I have no sense of my time now because I forgot to start my timer at the start. So I'm going to say very quickly something about the person document. Uh, to be a witness is to be an instrument of proof, an instrument of proof that is tested in the courtroom uh, by the judges, by the advocates involved. Uh, and it's a vital part of the process. The witnesses themselves, however, are vital. They are living corporeal beings. And what I've been thinking about is linked to something called embodied research. And whilst it's not embodied research as such, it wasn't set out and designed in that way, as a kind of informed by that approach, uh, reflective way of thinking, and perhaps still attached to ideas of enlightenment, objectivity, and evidence. What I want to introduce uh, is the idea, based on that thing, of what can bodies do? 
And one thing that bodies can do is become documents. They can become documents in the form of witnesses. Um, we as veterans of a courtroom or indeed in the guinea pigs in that courtroom in that novel experimental environment have a physical experience. Uh, and just to be clear, we all tend to think of documents as written, pieces of paper with writing on them. If we spread our, our thoughts a little more widely, we can think of them as inanimate physical material or recording of information, which might also be graphic or aural, uh, increasingly digital, reflecting all the other different elements. Um, but it can, but at, the, at its root, if, in the etymology of, of of, of that idea of a document is something that is evidence, that is proof. Uh, it stems from the Latin for proof, and, it, and that itself stems from the Latin docere for to teach. And so as teachers, and we're used to being teachers in university classrooms as well, and in other ways in life, what we're doing is being the encapsulation of documentation, the launch pad for other uses of documentation, but appearing physically as a document, as a document that has to be tested, that, it, that is a, a, a presence uh, that, that has to concentrate, that has to have appearance, that has to have possession, uh, that has to endure dreadfully bad backs, which is what I had for the first three days of trial experience. Uh, almost unable to sleep, unable to prepare. But these are all part of the process. And it's that document as a product of documents, but also as a trigger for further documentation that is the idea I want to introduce. Um, but I haven't got much further than that. And I'm guessing the time really must have gone by now because I didn't start the clock at the right time. So uh, I'll stop uh, having probably kind of confused people more than enough or send them to sleep. James, thank you, that was excellent. Lots of questions, but I'm gonna hold my fire and, ha um, and hand to um, Ivor first. I'm really looking forward to, to discussing this further. Ivor, could I bring you in? Sure, thank you very much. Um, we're in the same room that that was uh, uh, hopefully now it's it's resolved uh, if you just don't mind Eva <laughs> it's, it's it's all right um all right um uh, so let me get started first of all thank you very much uh, uh for chairing this panel and thank you for the organizers it's a pleasure to be here so I will be speaking today about defense strategies of alleged perpetrators at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and I'm going to be specifically focusing on Sinebani. So I don't have a PowerPoint, I'm just going to talk through some of the early thoughts um, on, on uh, this research. I want to say that you know, this is an early draft and, I'm draft, and I'm just starting to work on this, but it seems to me that it's important to invest some time into understanding defense arguments. And I think this nicely ties into the, the previous paper, because I do not actually think that this has been done uh, sufficiently. So I'm focusing uh, on the ICTY, so the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, because it conducted a great number of trials, uh, actually greater than other international uh, courts. And there is a set of trials that de dealt with uh, Srebrenica conducted over a period of 20 years, um, and it concerned military and civilian defendants, high up, lower level, including uh, executioners. Um, and because genocide, of course, is such a great accusation, um, therefore, it is uh, fascinating to consider how individuals defend themselves against these uh, grave accusations. So due to time limitations, I'm just going to proceed, assuming that you know the basics, kind of the basic contours about what happened in Srebrenica and around East Bosnia in July 1995. So at the ICTY, I would say the system is adversarial, so the, the sides, the prosecution and the defense largely sell, sell a story, so to say, a legal theory um, and, and evidence to the judges, and then they see sort of if they bite, uh, so to say, which makes it interesting as these arguments are then explicit and designed to be convincing, and we can even talk about how they resonate beyond uh, the courtroom. So the main question about this exploration, uh, for this exploration, is what strategies and arguments have been, um, have the accused at the ICTY used to defend themselves against allegations of perpetrating genocide in Srebrenica as argued by the prosecution? So an additional paper, which is not an additional question, which is not in the draft paper is, do they focus on themselves 
or do they kind of think about defending the, the state or the political project, or do they defend themselves but frame it as a defense of the of the project and the nation? Because of course, anyone who followed the ICTY knows that it has been often said in this way or the other that I'm not here uh, defending myself, I'm defending the nation, and then things like that. So. I'm a historian and the sources that this research is based on are all publicly available. The ICTY is actually the only international court which allows as much access to its transcripts and evidence as well as court documents, which also brings me to take this opportunity to nudge other um, international courts um, and, and actually domestic uh, as well as I've done elsewhere to do the same and provide access because for historians, this is really uh, incredibly rich material. I was also an analyst uh, in the Special War Crimes Department of the Prosecutor's Office in Bosnia and Herzegovina about 10, 12 years ago. Um, so I worked on many of these cases myself and my research also draws heavily on, on that experience. So my main sources are final briefs. So these are documents that come at the end of the trial where normally the, the council kind of packages the, the final uh, sort of argumentation and key evidence into a narrative story about how their version of events and kind of what their arguments are, um, as well as transcripts of closing arguments, which mirror uh, this, these final briefs, uh, witness statements, military documents, all other, uh, other kinds of evidence. Um, the outcome of the trial, so what judges say about these arguments and the veracity of this claim is not so important to me here. It is more about how they accuse, how the accused choose to present their case and, and why. And I will just sketch out some arguments briefly and welcome uh, uh, opinions if you think I'm missing some of the big ones. So the trials I think matter because of what Diane Ordensleher said many years ago, they shrink the space for denial. So today only people, I would say at the very margins of the political discourse said that, claim that nothing happened in Srebrenica. And we actually see that in court too. What is disputed is the circumstances that led to the killings, how many people were killed, um, and very importantly, crucially, they dispute the genocide label as a legal category. Uh, they talk about the terrible crime, Strashan uh, Zlochin in BCS, Bosnia and Serbian Croatian. So some of the notable cases that maybe some of the participants want to look into are Dražen Etemović, Radislav Krstić, uh, Popović, uh, and others, Ravko Tolimir, of course, Radovan Karadžić, Radko Mladić. These are people at different levels, different responsibilities, civilian, military, kind of intelligence, um, uh, high up, and in Dražen Etemović's case, an actual uh, kind of shooter. They're all completed. All convictions for Srebrenica-related crimes. Um, so these are, I think, a very rich uh, resource to look into. So the mass executions were really kind of a logistical challenge, so to say. And we see in the ICTY evidence records of the Bosnian Serb army struggling to have some of these completed. So we have communications be between various uh, accused, many people who were involved. And this also, of course, leaves traces of how they were uh, involved. And anecdotally in watching trials, I remember seeing in one courtroom, the army blaming the police for some crimes, while at the same time in the other courtroom, the police was blaming the army. <laughs> so I think this is really something interesting to, to look into. Um, I also find it interesting that, you know, uh, uh, no one came to court and says, yes, I did it. And yes, I meant it. Uh, even though uh, uh, many of them, you know, kind of had these larger than life personalities. Modic, for example, is a good example of that. So of course, maybe that's not realistic at the end of the day, everyone wants to not be in jail. Uh, but it's, it's, I think, also interesting to think about that uh, at the end of the day, many of the accused, you know, had no knowledge, had no power, had no ability to stop anything. And to the extent that they had any ability, they did everything they could, but then darn, something happened. Um, just prosecution arguments were very briefly about the circumstances in the Srebrenica enclave, about the Bosnian army entering the town, about the, the people fleeing at the UN base, about the two or three nights before the women and children were transported away, about the column of mostly men trying to flee the gov to the government controlled territory. And I have no time to go into all of the, the story here. So sorry if this flies a little bit above the heads of some of the, the participants, but these are also uh, the executions of course, and the burials and the primary and secondary graves. Um, and, and of course, then the defense also responds to those prosecution arguments because the prosecution is driving the, the, the course, the, the case forward. So um, of course the prosecution also argued, you know, what was the particular role for each accused? So there's a big narrative that's similar, 
And then, of course, there's the details uh, for each particular accused based on their uh, role and participation. We also have, of course, uh, guilty pleas, uh, which are interesting because to a certain extent they accept, or to a large extent, they accept the crucial parts of the prosecution narrative. Uh, Drajan Demovic, for example, the executioner, um, offered kind of an explanation of fear and duress um, to explain his participation. And that's also interesting because this is kind of a set of arguments that not that is not really available to those high up because you know for general Mahdi she can't like fear of duress of, of what. So it's also interesting how they come as a result of people's position and people's personal circumstances. So what about the defense just in a couple of minutes? So one argument that seems to be key for the defense in several cases is that some persons were killed, but that it was not ordered. Um, it was mostly framed as an act of revenge, kind of uncontrollable because uh, Serbs in, in, in those areas around Srebrenica suffered raids uh, from uh, the, the enclave's territory. So this was kind of a revenge, um, sort of some kind of a, an eruption of, of kind of you know, hatred or revenge after the, the enclave fell. Another key argument is, for example, for the first mass killing that happened that, uh, in, Sreb, in, in Kravica, in a, a kind of an agricultural warehouse on the 13th of July, where over a thousand people were killed. Um, is again this revenge idea that there was a Serb policeman who was killed uh, by the Bosniak detainees and then kind of the Serb forces retaliated. And this is what drove the killing of over a thousand people. That's kind of the, the, the story. Um, another argument has to do with the victims so that, that those killed were in fact soldiers killed in battle and not executed. So here we saw a lot of testimony also by experts talking about entry wounds and bullet holes and angles and you know uh, uh, tied hands and, and things like that. So there was a lot of that kind of evidence where the prosecution and the defense focused on these uh, uh, kinds of arguments. And, and the defense was very much kind of strong on this point that many of the victims were not in fact executed but were uh, uh, killed in, in battle. And that the burials performed by Bosnian Serb authorities in the aftermath were not clandestine but they were an attempt to contain disease. So in BCS, we would say asanatia terena, which is something that you normally do after a battle. Uh, uh, so they kind of, this was the, the argument for why they were putting the dead uh, uh, in, in graves. So in terms of forensic evidence, just also one kind of illustration is that, for example, the blindfolds that some of the victims were wearing at the time of the execution, um, the defense very much framed it as these were not blindfolds, these were bandanas as worn by Bosniak fighters, kind of Mujahideen sort of forces. So these are like bandanas that then kind of fell on their eyes um, after death or in the moment of death, but they were not, uh, they were not actually uh, blindfolds. Uh, and this is also something that we see in a, in a number of different cases. So just to conclude um, in the interest of time. So uh, what I think is really interesting is that the, the defense arguments seem to be similar and they seem to run across time and cases, which is interesting because in these cases, judges are not buying them, or at least the majority of judges in the majority of cases are not buying them. So it's interesting to see that they are still perpetuated and repeated in future cases, even though like guys, it's not really working. <laughs> so I, I find that really interesting. Um, it, it will be also, I think, fascinating to try to compare, um, you know, how this changed over time, were people defending themselves much differently in the late 90s or early 2000s when the forensic evidence was much poorer than in comparison to the cottage modage cases by which time many of the grays were found, many of the DNA analysis was done, the prosecution was much more ready to prosecute at this late hour because they practiced, so to say, with many kind of lower level um, uh, uh, cases before. It would also be interesting to see, you know, high level, lower levels, strategy, civilian, military, but also one thing to investigate, I would also argue, would be local cases. Many of them were in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but there were also a handful in Serbia. These are kind of middle level to lower level perpetrators. And it would also, you know, it's a different legal framework, of course, it's a different style of trial. It's not an adversarial process. It's um, kind of an investigative judge more kind of driven uh, um, a process. So I think that would be interesting as well. But there the problem is again, that the um, uh, material is not available largely. Um, so I would again, kind of try to nudge our conversations also to these kinds of uh, pressures or advocacy to release as much as possible the, the records for uh, 
um, for uh, research. So I'm just uh, start, starting to dig deeper uh, into this and I'm looking forward to your comments and thank you very much. I hope I was okay with time. Thank you. Um, and also really, really valuable reflections. And I hope we can pick up on some of those temporal questions. I know you've written on it previously as well. So I think that there's real, um, really valuable sort of overlap with some of the other papers as well. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. Yes. Hello. We, you can't be heard. Can you hear me now? Is that better? If I'm sorry, I'll come closer. Excellent on time, Eva. I'll pick it up in the in the discuss and comments. Let me hand to Lena. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to the erudite panelists for sharing your research. And thank you to, to Michael and Nicola and the Conflict Records Unit team uh, for having me on this panel to share my recent research. Um, so in, in 2021, while I was uh, pursuing my legal studies, I was also working with the Center of Information Resilience, which is a London-based NGO with a team of open source investigative experts who are using their, their skills to, to capture, assess, and verify open source information that provides witness to human rights abuses and state violence against uh, civilian populations in conflict. So my legal studies combined with my work with the center is kind of really what drove me to question how this relatively new form of evidence will be admitted into the courts to achieve accountability for these very grave crimes. Um, this is particularly as a lot of these investigators and as activists are collecting this evidence that is posted online without really knowing what accountability mechanism or what jurisdiction it's going to be used as evidence in. Um, so in recent years, we've, we've really seen a shift in international criminal justice uh, towards the prosecution of core international crimes in the domestic courts under the principle of uh, universal jurisdiction. Um, particularly, for example, you know, with Syria, the, the outlook for a potential accountability mechanism or tribunal being set up seems so distant. Um, meanwhile, we've seen in Germany, France, Sweden, uh, Finland, have already prosecuted war criminals from the Syrian conflict in their domestic courts under universal jurisdiction. So this is incredibly promising. And a lot of these, these, uh, these courts have used open source evidence as the basis for prosecution. So meanwhile, in the UK, universal has, has not gained so much, uh, you know, universal jurisdiction has not gained so much traction uh, only a few of such prosecutions have proceeded to the English courts and even fewer have resulted in, in actual convictions. There are various reasons for this. Um, however, a lot of the experts posit that this has been largely due to concerns about the standard of evidence upon which these arrest warrants are issued. Um, however, as we all know, obtaining the necessary evidence and identifying witnesses and particularly tangible evidence of a crime that took place in a conflict in another territory pre presents significant challenges. Um, so with the very nature of these core international crimes such as torture, crimes against humanity and war crimes, render them amongst the most complex and difficult crimes to prosecute. These challenges are compounded when these investigations or trials take place far away from where the crimes are being committed, whether it be for political, legal or security reasons. So these are just some of the evidentiary challenges that are inherent in international criminal justice. Meanwhile, while tangible evidence is difficult, if not impossible to reach, open source information documenting crimes can be found online readily and in overabundance. So we've seen, you know, particularly with the onset of the Syrian conflict, an enormous amount of user generated content being posted online and distributed in almost real time directly from ongoing sites of violence and conflict. Open source information has gained significant attention over the last decade, partic particularly as war crimes and crimes against humanity in places like Syria, Man Myanmar, and even Ukraine uh, right now, as we can see, are being documented online in almost real time. So I believe that the internet has really opened the door for who is doing the documenting in conflict. We're increasingly seeing documentation in the forms of images and videos being shared online directly either by, by victims or witnesses or sometimes even perpetrators themselves. Uh, we've also seen 
and you know organizations emerge such as the Syrian Archive and Bellingcat who are doing you know amazing investigative work and have made tremendous strides in in collecting, ver verifying, and, and archiving massive amounts of open source information related to these kinds of crimes and conflict. Um, and, and their work has been incredibly important in, in preserving a lot of the, these experiences that are shared directly from, from conflicts on the ground. So digital open source information, just to provide a quick definition, is any kind of information on the internet that is available to any member of the public, whether it's through observation, purchase, or request. And open source information becomes evidence when it carries evidentiary value so that it can be admitted into the court and establish facts in legal proceedings. So I, in my opinion, with the ubiquity of the internet, it seems almost inevitable that, that open source evidence will soon be inevitable in criminal proceedings. So I believe that the question really now for the international justice, criminal justice community is how can we leverage open source evidence to facilitate future criminal investigations and prosecutions? With the immense amount of open source information documenting these crimes that are online, Obviously, this presents enormous opportunity within the legal practice. It, sorry, it provides invaluable evidence and details of the who, what, where of crimes. Open source information also allows investigators to overcome evidentiary barriers, identify, identify witnesses, and oftentimes it may even provide crucial corroborating evidence of the time, location, victims, and even perpetrators of a crime. However, with as with any other type of evidence, there are, it comes with inherent evidentiary challenges. And it is also vulnerable to biases, gaps, and, and potential manipulation. So the questions for those seeking to rely on open source evidence in the courts is now, uh, how are we going to persuade the court to, to admit this kind of evidence you know, into evidence? <laughs> how are we going to persuade the court to admit open source information into the courts? And how are we going to persuade the court that the item of evidence is indeed authentic and reliable as a real piece of evidence? So in the context of digital open source information, this is going to you know, pose significant challenges, particularly where videos or photos documenting crimes have been either uploaded anonymously or the provenance of the item is unknown. There's also you know, the element of, of we are currently living in an era of fake news and disinformation, and we see competing narratives seeking to dominate how war is being perceived by the public emerging online in almost real time. So therefore, proving that an item of evidence is reliable, in other words, that it is what it purports to be, will play a key role with the courts in determining and establishing its admissibility. So as, as my colleagues would know who have experience working with the ICC, um, you know, they have somewhat more lenient <laughs> evidence, uh, evidence admissibility standards in the courts of England and Wales. However, they've already made strides in, in welcoming the use of open source information. Um, as in 2015, uh, in the case of Ahmed al faqi al-Mahdi, uh, he was uh, prosecuted and, and, and convicted um, uh, for the destruction of, of cultural heritage. Uh, just based on, on open source evidence found online, including geolocation, social media, videos, and satellite imagery. And in 2017, the ICC also issued an arrest warrant against the now deceased Libyan warlord Mahmoud al warfali based entirely on open source evidence after a video emerged on social media of a special forces unit headed by him uh, committing summary executions of, of uh, over 20 blindfolded men. Um, he was later killed and he, he never, he unfortunately never got to go to trial. However, uh, an arrest warrant was issued on the basis of these videos that were found uh, and, and distributed on social media. So where the ICC cannot la launch an investigation, investigators can collect open source evidence and hand this over to prosecutors for use in universal jurisdiction cases. So as we, I've mentioned, we've seen this shift in Europe where open source evidence has played a crucial role in impacting the initiation of, of, of investigations and in, in, into universal jurisdiction prosecutions for war crimes, and in, in particularly in Syria and Iraq. These are the main ones that we've seen so far. 
Um, we have a landmark case, uh, a universal jurisdiction case in Koblenz, Germany, that uh, you know, the judgment was just issued uh, very recently, where a former Syrian regime official was convicted for several charges of torture and other crimes against humanity, while he was the head of the Al Khatib uh, detention center in Damascus in Syria. So, you know, the court admitted evidence from the prosecutions, what they had termed structural investigation. So they had gathered enormous amounts of open source material regarding widespread and systematic uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes uh, by the Syrian regime in Syria. And while the, the defense was raised that this was not directly relevant to the defendant because it didn't establish a clear link between himself and the crimes, uh, it, uh, the court admitted it on the basis that it provided a wider context into what was systematically happening in detention centers across Syria. And therefore it was, not, it was found not to be too prejudicial to the defendant and, uh, and provided valuable contextual evidence into what was occurring at the time. Um, so this also demonstrates how universal jurisdiction cases can use OSE to, oh, sorry, open source evidence to really create, to establish a link between a particular person and a crime. Um, so as we can, you know, open source evidence has incredible evidentiary value um, for international criminal justice. And while there are clear evidentiary challenges associated with its admissibility in the courts, um, he, there are tremendous strides that have been made by organizations in a somewhat ad hoc matter um, by open source investigative experts and the criminal international criminal justice community uh, who have been developing methodologies such as the Berkeley Protocol for collecting, authenticating, and preserving open source evidence in adherence to legal admissibility standards for accountability mechanisms. So in conclusion, I won't go into the, the nitty gritty of, of English law and admissibility, but um, although you know, it is already in use in the ICC and in the European courts, and to a certain degree here in, in the courts of England and Wales as well, there is still very little authoritative common law guidance uh, on how it, how it will be evaluated for, for its authenticity, its reliability, its relevance, um, and its provenance. So, you know, largely applying existing evidentiary principles to these items of evidence will, you know, with the same amount of scrutiny and standards for authentication and verification, are sufficient for now. I think that going forward, we need more authoritative guidance from the higher courts on how we can apply these evidentiary standards to open source evidence and, uh, and provide greater clarity and consistency in how its admissibility will be, will be evaluated. And so that's, that's it for me. And I, I open to, to questions and a discussion perhaps would be more fun uh, with the colleagues. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that, that Lena Rustin um, is, is coming up as Nicola Palmer on the notes. And obviously that is not, you know, this is Lena Rustin. And thank you so much, Lena. It was really, um, really excellent. So just to make sure we don't direct questions to the wrong person. Um, now, what we, we have some excellent questions on the chat and I'm going to bring those in in a minute. Um, but I did get to have the, oh, we have, now we have, um, <laughs> um, James, are you now sharing your screen? I think that's okay. Um, just give me a second then that um, I had my, just give me one second. Let me just get that. Um, okay, great. Um, so that was, thank you, James, for, um, for bringing Rob really into the picture there. That's good to see him. I'm sorry he couldn't join us. Um, but let me, take, let me take two minutes to ask um, all of the panelists um, a couple of questions that came out from from your presentations, but but also from your papers. And as I mentioned, Eva and and um, Lena, I really enjoyed reading your papers. Um, so James, my question for you on the on the expert evidence um, is that I first I really like the um, the reflexive process of having been having given that evidence and then reflecting on what that says about expert evidence before these trials, and it and it obviously brought me to to Richard Wilson's work where he makes an argument. He's obviously looked at expert evidence in relation to establishing the histor historical um, 
the, the role of history in international criminal trials. And then in his recent work, he's looked at the role of expert evidence in establishing claims around, um, the causation claims around hate speech um, across the ICTR, the ICTY and the ICC. But, one, but my question for you is this, Richard suggests that, there are, that depending on the substantive area, judges find expert witness testimony more different types of expert witness testimony more persuasive so when we were when you were looking at linguistic interpretations of whether or not a speech would be would incite then um qualitative data was seen um was be, was very well received by the judges but when they were looking at questions of determining, certainly before the ICTR, determining belonging to the ethnic group, in that case, Tutsi, then the sociological and, and anthropological testimony was dealt with extreme skepticism. And the judges were much more comfortable looking at testimony from mostly humanitarian workers um, who could testify that, um, that this individual was holding um, a particular ID card that indicated a particular ethnic belonging. And so we see these very, we sort of see different ways through which expert testimony is received by the judges, depending on the substantive um, point that that expert testimony is speaking to. And, and, I, and I just want, um, really value your thoughts on that. Um, and then Eva, I, um, I, you know, I, I think the, the, the account sort of engaging as a historian with the, um, with the public records that have been generated by the ad hoc tribunals and also, and also by the ICC now is hugely valuable. And so my question is about the, um, in, in your paper, I wasn't entirely clear as to whether you were only looking at cases where the defense counsel had, um, where the individuals had defended themselves personally, so they, um, or where, where they were being um, represented by, um, by legal counsel. Because obviously with ICTR defendants, I mean, ICTY defendants, there was quite a lot of difference there. And I wonder if you saw difference in the, um, in the legal strategies um, and, in, and in the account that's told, I suppose. And then I suppose that also goes to, to, to Nigel Elchingham's work, where he suggests that before the ICTR, defense counsel took one of two approaches. Either they saw themselves as, as sort of telling the untold story, making the grand narrative, or they saw themselves as really an indiv individualized contestation of a particular factual allegation. And so I wonder the extent to which you're seeing similar difference um, as, it, as it's represented in the, in the documents that have come out of the ICTY, because his, his material is obviously coming out from, from ethnographic and, and qualitative interview-based work. Um, and then finally, um, Lena, um, picking up, so I, I really liked, uh, you know, I, I actually, I really liked the legal detail that you went into, um, particularly identifying the criteria of relevance, authenticity, and reliability as the criteria on which open source evidence will be assessed in, in courts before, in, um, in England and Wales. And I wanted to, I also note in your presentation that you really picked up on the idea that the ICC, following on from the ad hoc tribunals, has been very generous in its, um, in its admission of, uh, and it's, it, on the admissibility standards for evidence, including admission of hearsay evidence. Um, but one of the things that looking at the cases um, before the ICC at the moment shows is that there's quite a split in terms of the approach to assessing that evidence. And the split goes along this lines. Either they're saying we need to be looking at the relevance, authenticity, and reliability of a single piece of evidence, or we need to be looking at the authenticity, reliability of a holistic body of evidence. And so the question of, of admissibility is either is not a question of only looking at one source of it, in some instances, one source of evidence, or in others, it's looking holistically at triangulating across um, a range of evidence, in which case we could determine the authenticity based on the extent to which is triangulated by other evidence. And so I wondered if you were, the extent to which you were seeing any of that in the reasoning um, before UK courts generally on admissibility um, of evidence, and broadly your view on that. So should we be looking at 
determining the reliability um, and authenticity um, and relevance of a single piece of evidence? Or should we be arguing for a holistic approach? And the, the judges, certainly at the ICC, have been very divided on that. Um, and then the um, and then this this sort of picks up on on Matthew Ford's comment in the in the or contribution in the previous session of the um, of the provenance of open source evidence and the extent to which one can actually track where a piece of evidence is being generated from um, and how you think that would fit into this relevance authenticity and, and reliability criteria that just that that the courts are actually applying certainly here in in england and wales um so that's from me maybe I'll, I'll let the panelists each have a moment to respond to that um and then i'll um i'll bring i'll bring in the general questions we still have we still have 20 minutes which is great i think you're going first because you were the first panelist I think so, James. I'm afraid. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, it, it, it may take time. I, I'm, I'm inclined to address Nandana's questions in the Q and A. Do you want me to do that or not? Yes, definitely. I was going to bring Nandana in next to to verbalise them. But if you want to, if you want to address them as well, that's that's great, James. Go for it. Well, if you want to bring her in to verbalise, that's good. If that's possible, I, I didn't know that was an option, but. Um, uh, First on Richard Wilson, yeah. Um, his work, yeah, the, the historians in the courtroom in history, well, I'm very interested in history as a believer in what you can gain from the various material that emerges from these processes uh, and the issues around the, the, the scope of that material because of the purpose for which it was adduced in the first place. Um, I would point that there's a kind of difficulty in that approach of seeing historians. Uh, when he interviewed me a long, long time ago for that book and project, I pointed out, A, that I was not necessarily an historian and a mongrel, which might include some bits of history, but also my purpose, uh, and that's not how it was labelled uh, in, in trials, but also that the purpose, and this comes back to a bit in, that I read out from Bob, uh, was to establish subject matter jurisdiction. Yeah. You have to establish for grave breaches, for example, that there was an international armed conflict. Um, so the purpose of the evidence, even then, was not necessarily or primarily about, about the history. So I think a part of that question uh, yeah, when you say some evidence, I think I'm trying to read my notes of what you said, but depending on substantive area, is the evidence more persuasive? I would say uh, that might or might not be the case. It might be down to the credibility, the performance of witness, and this is where it comes to the idea of being an embodied document. Uh, and how that document is treated in exactly the same way we can discuss with Nina and Matt about the kind of authentic authentication, veracity, reliability of bits of digital information. Yeah, one of the purposes uh, of the person document uh, is to be tested for reliability and authenticity, but also to be the instrument of demonstrating reliability, veracity, authenticity for those different things. And, and what it comes down to, I think, more than anything else, uh, is the use that counsel makes of that document. Uh, and, and I can show this in a way quite clearly uh, through that first Tadich trial, where the initial judgment, and of course part of what was doing was was giving history and background because the trial attorney wanted that to happen as to, uh, and some that's necessary for establishing the jurisdictional issues but that in the initial trial judgment uh, the reference to the evidence that both Bob and I gave was something along the lines of they mostly gave 
complementary evidence yeah uh, and yeah where they disagree we've kind of ignored it or kind of massaged it in some way and then we just move on um when it came to and, and that's because the council didn't although they introduced the evidence uh that the lead trial attorney was determined in a very anglo it was australian anglo barrister tradition not to tell the judges what to think you don't tell the judges what to think uh, and when the judges hadn't been told what to think and what something was about they didn't actually for themselves get the work out what it was about or in case in some of the, in judge mcdonald's separate opinion kind of said there was stuff here that we could have used and we weren't told what to do with it and so when it came to the appeals chamber the prosecution then took that same material and argued it in a different way and then it's referred to and taken note of so in a sense the answer to your question is maybe not only to do with the person document of the witness but more to do with the way in which counsel makes use of the document in the proceedings um uh, I'll stop, even though I want to say a lot about the questions you posed to Eva and Nina, and I'll talk about Nandana's, but if you can give Nandana in still, then I'll, I'll hold off. I think you're you muted. Un yeah. Nandana, as an attendee, can you unmic and, and ask the, the, the specific questions to James? And Eva. Yes, yes, I was going to do one at a time when we when we go to Eva, definitely. I don't know if that's possible. It might not be in which case. Take, oh yeah, should we just take them? So, yeah. sorry, uh, questions questions from uh, participants in the audience, they, they, they have to put them in the Q&A. It's only uh, uh, invited uh, panelists who can uh, okay. unmute. Okay, great, great. Thank you, thank you. James, are you all right on that? Please do take Nandana's questions and then... Well, um, no, Eva can go around and then we can come back unless you want me to do now. Okay. okay, okay, that's fine. I'm happy with that too. Eva. Sure. Um, so let me first address the questions that you asked, which was basically about was there a difference between people who defended themselves as opposed to people who were represented by counsel? I want to say by even for people who were um, defending themselves, for example, in Milosevic's case or in Radko, in Radovan Karadzic's case, they still get advice. So this idea that they're really representing themselves, I mean, yeah, but also no. <laughs> and, and of course, as, as lawyers will know, even in cases where uh, clients are represented, the, you know, the, the representation is also informed by the desire um, to have a certain strategy. So I think in, in some ways they're maybe less different than what we normally think about uh, when we think about this. But for all the cases that ended, so Milosevic aside, because that case didn't end, all the cases that ended with convictions that I was talking about, only Radovan Karadzic really uh, defended himself. And he, of course, had counsel, Peter Robinson, but also others uh, who advised him. Um, I think that has to do first with the profile and the character of the person. So Radovan Karadzic was, of course, a politician. He very much enjoyed attention, very much enjoyed long, big narratives about how things happen. He loves the mic. He loves the, and, I mean, you know. That's that's to a certain extent. Uh, to a certain extent, also a matter I would say of ability, like physical ability to be able to be in court for hours at a time, follow things in detail, respond, ask questions to witnesses for hours on end, weeks sometimes for the same witnesses, and that ability sometimes simply physically isn't available to others. For example, Radko Mladic was just frail, and it's just you know one would argue I think also kind of intellectually you know, would struggle with contain. He had a stroke. He, so, right, as James says, so he, so I think it's also an issue of, of ability and not only like choice and also of profile, you know, maybe military guys are just less likely to be, you know, kind of taking that kind of a role, which is very much, you know, a, a sort of a, a, in the center of attention, a narrative a, a kind of a, a role to take. So there are, I think, these uh, sort of uh, differences. Um, and, and in relation to kind of presenting the big narrative and defending the state, the nation, the political project or whatever, as opposed to defending themselves specifically, I think the smarter ones defend themselves specifically and they're getting better advice now than I think they would potentially in the 1990s when everyone was still like, oh, what are we doing here? And how does this process work? And uh, now I think good lawyers are all saying like, you know, forget about the project. 
I mean, defend yourself. And I think, so I think that's also a feature of just people knowing better how a process works, defense attorneys being more focused, prosecutions being more focused, judges knowing what to do with things better. So I would say that um, now, I mean, to a certain extent, of course, especially for the high level cases, you can't present a personal defense without addressing the project. Radko Mladic or Radovan Karadzic can't defend themselves without saying something about the project. But guys like Dražen Dedemović could, I think, because he's like, you know, or, or could more because he was not in a political decision-making uh, sort of position and he was defending himself for a particular day, for a particular thing, for a particular uh, shooting. And also because he was contrite. Yes, right. So I think there's also differences in, in, in that respect, sort of where one is and just kind of how your uh, indictment is shaped and then you kind of respond uh, uh, to that. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and then maybe in the next round we'll, we'll say something more. I'm going to be greedy and I'm going to chip in on Eva there as well. Uh, because it goes back to the same a, a version of the same point I was making before about counsel and the role of counsel. Uh, but in this case, uh, it, it, it's a bit of a reversal. Yeah, counsel still follow the client lead. Uh, I don't have time to go into anecdotal detail, but I talked to some of the defense counsel in some of the big cases about why they didn't see what seemed to me other, and I want to ask you for this question about identifying any alternative. Right. approaches any alternative strategies in the research that she's done. So I know the case where to me it seemed that they could have offered a different defense, but they stuck with the one that they were told to offer because that was the big narrative that they were supposed to be offering. Yeah, and the council kind of could walk away or they could just go along with what they're they're, they're told to do. Thanks, Eva. And also going to this, you know, it's your, your point on the temporality of this, that those strategies have changed over time as um, as council have become more aware of what which ones have better, better legal traction. Lena, can I can I bring you in? Yes, sure. Thank you. All right. Um, so with regards to the first question of whether should we be looking at, you know, authenticating open source evidence? Uh, with a more holistic approach or kind of uh, in a more singular manner. Um, and as you mentioned with the ICC, they kind of have a more broader scope of admissibility. So as I understand it, evidence, you know, open source evidence is, is admitted. And then once it's been admitted, then the court will evaluate its probative value. Um, whereas in England, there's a, there are far more, uh, like there's like kind of a series of tests. There is no silver bullet. It's a series of tests. Um, if, if an item of evidence is not prima facie authentic, then, then they will, then they will have a voir dire kind of like a mini trial to evaluate that piece of evidence, in which case, you know, the party seeking to adduce that evidence will, will have to introduce additional kind of triangulating or verifying evidence to prove its authenticity. Um, so in that sense, it, it is, it, it's kind of, it will be assessed in a singular way. However, you can, you can establish its veracity in a holistic way. Um, and I think that here, uh, expert testimony, uh, you know, if an open source investigator becomes uh, an expert within his own right and is able to go to court and testify um, as to the, the methods that they've used for, for verification, establishing authenticity, provenance, um, also chain of custody, handling of it, um, you know, demonstrating perhaps through their own techniques that it hasn't been manipulated or tampered with in any way. Um, then I think in that in that way, you know, I, I prefer the English the English law approach to be fair than the civil law jurisdictions, which which is uh, much more prudent and uh, it's much more to the discretion of the courts. I think that if we introduce too stringent of methods to authenticating, admitting, and admitting open source evidence, then we risk uh, it being lost and not used in legal proceedings. So as long as there's there's some more authoritative guidance from the courts and, and how they're going to be doing it, but no strict kind of this is how it, you know, step like, you know, laying out the steps of how to authenticate it in a proper way. Um, I think that would uh, that would be unfair to open source evidence. And then um, with regards to to, to provenance, um, as I see it, there, there are two elements to provenance. Um, you know, in part of the authenticating process. Uh, first, it's it's if you can establish the kind of uh, the user or the mechanical origins of that item of evidence. 
um, and where you cannot, for example, where either it's anonymous or, you know, it's been shared so many times online that you can no longer identify the original source, then there, the courts will allow also, you don't have to produce the original item of evidence for, and it's from the original source, but so long as you can establish the integrity of that item of evidence. Um, so, uh, you know, as I, you know, in answering the first question, expert testimony here is incredibly valuable in, in kind of describing and laying out the methods of how they've, they've authenticated that item of evidence and, um, and, and the Berkeley protocol and all of these kind of like methodologies for collecting evidence to legal admissibility standards have been incredibly valuable. And on that particular point, I think that, um, you know, on chain of custody, uh, and establishing that it's been preserved throughout the chain of custody from, from going from online into the hands of the investigator. Um, uh, I think that blockchain will probably play a very big role in the future, whether you know, victims or witnesses on the grounds have blockchain technology to be able to, to record uh, in real time and upload that online when they're documenting crimes, or if um, you know, after collecting that uh, that open source evidence, uh, you know, experts can then secure it with a blockchain technology so that it can't be altered um, in any way. So, yeah, I think that the blockchain will probably be uh, the future <laughs> uh, in a lot of this type of evidence that we see. Excellent, thank you. That's so interesting. Um, James and Eva, can I bring you in um, to respond to? Um, um, Namdana. Uh, brilliant questions. It's so nice to get such kind of like, oh, real questions. Um, uh, I, I will, I, I'm going to step on Eva's toes and also come on a couple of questions to her as well. Um, yeah, the rationale to choose the final briefs or closing arguments. Uh, evil will answer for herself, it's her rationale, but it seems to me quite obvious that that's where the argument is stated. And if you're looking at the narrative argument, that's where you get the essence of it. Uh, she may have a different answer, but that's the sort of thing. Um, and I think, yeah, the issue of consistency is a really important one. And I'm not sure what either will say, but I think it's going to be an interesting question because it relates to the question I just asked her before as well, which is, yeah, kind of, were there alternative paths? Were they ever followed? Uh, it's an important thing to tell. Uh, on the big questions, uh, I first want to point out in the idea of talking about person document that this is a physical process, but it's a visual process. And watching the courtroom, being in the courtroom, but even more as I later on have watched it, is like watching a soap opera. And so there's a difference between having the transcript from a hearing where you get a written account of things that happen and actually watching people and seeing what happens. And that does make a difference. And at times it can make a difference if you're watching the bench uh, in how they behave, but also in how they respond to the others in the court. And I think that's an important element when it comes to talking about you know, you know, the use of narratives uh, in judgment. And then she says, would it have made a difference if we'd been called later? Of course it would have made a difference. I can't tell you what that difference is, but you know, intrinsically, it has to be that it would have made a difference. Um, would it have made a really big substantive difference overall? Uh, can't be sure. Uh, I hold the rather vain personal view that in the fragile situation of the Yugoslavia tribunal, in those early days and the way it was starting, uh, that I was the one-eyed in the land of the blind and the best one-stop shop available at that moment. Later on, yeah, better, better things became available for some of the issues. Um, but if it hadn't been established at that point that they could have jurisdiction over the crimes to be charged, then the whole project might have floundered. So could it have come later? Maybe, but it might not have been there later had it been otherwise. Can't say for sure, we don't know, but there would have been some difference. Um, uh, had, would it have been different if we'd been on the other side? Uh, quite possibly in some ways, in others not, as I indicated in that initial trial, the initial trial chamber said, well, the evidence kind of complementary overlaps a lot and we kind of just don't worry too much about the differences. Um, but at the same time, I think it's unlikely that Bob and I 
agree on not many things except we've agreed on a lot to do with the experience of human witness and the responsibilities of those issues um uh, but you know uh, 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 but there are lots of things where we can agree on bits of information, but what they mean becomes different. So it's hard to imagine that we could or would have been, though I think it, it, you know, it, I point out that you know, I was always of the view, as we should be, that the role of the witness is to assist the court. People tend to see the adversarial process as being on one side or the other, and you're called by one side, and because that one side wants to lead evidence that will suit its purpose. Um, but the role is to assist the court. And so in that sense, you could be on either side and I would have been available to, uh, and indeed said that I was in one instance at least, to, to work on the defence side. But it would have been broadly the same evidence apart from whatever they wanted that was different. Uh, and the pedagogy of understanding history influenced by testimony, of course it is. Influenced by the whole pre process and presence. Yeah? The, you, know, you, you go as somebody with a specialist capacity, but it's a research process. You're working on things, you're learning things, and everything else that you do is wound up in one thing together, which is, again, why it's important to just continue this reflection about the person document about what it is and that idea of responsibility uh, but responsibility that has so many different dimensions i think that's it great thanks eva i, I note that we are we are at time i will be very i will be very brief Okay. And I, I do also note that Mike has his hand up and has been patiently waiting there. So maybe I'll get Mike's question if that's okay. And then and then we'll come back um, to have a final comment from, from everyone. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I thought all three of those um, talks were really, really interesting. James, James, what you were suggesting, I, I find really interesting and provocative in a, in a positive sense. And it has me thinking about something I've been grappling with since I started my current job and, that, and that's traditional categories legal categories of evidence so you know that can be cut you know across a bunch of different ways but i'm just thinking about the the iterations in understanding what a document is and what documentary evidence is that's already happened over the last 20 30 years with the advent of you know electronic media and electronically stored information and how much uh what a document is or what documentary evidence is um has been stretched to accommodate new media. Um, and, and I'm just, you know, that the sort of critical or interpretive approach, James, that you're taking to suggesting the, the expert witness as a document, um, and I'm thinking in terms of, you know, the knowledge they contain as opposed to what their bodies might physically present in terms of evidence, uh, and how that relates to, do, you know, those traditional legal categories of evidence. Are they, are they outmoded? Are they still good? Can we stretch them yet further? Um, or, or, you know, is, the, is, it, is it kind of a non-issue? I, I, I'm just, I guess I'm, my question is, what are your thoughts on that? Um, the, second, the second question is, is probably more of an observation. Uh, Lino, on, you, on your, uh, your points on open source evidence, um, you cited primarily, you know, you were pointing to the ICC's, the ICC's uh, use of this. But I, I'd suggest taking a closer look at some of the uh, mechanisms active now that are not focused on prosecutions, but on collecting evidence. Uh, look at the Myanmar mechanism in particular. They, they've suffered from lack of physical access. So there's been a default. I, I don't want to speak for them because I don't work on the inside, uh, but there's been a default to online sources of, of information. And you know, at least a year ago, they were recruiting online intelligence you know, specialists. Um, UNITAD, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the, the, the special advisor briefed the Security Council, and there was a side event, and it's, it was, it was uh, broadcast publicly on UN TV about the Camp Spiker massacre. And built into that argument, one of my colleagues presented, uh, part of the argument is built around a Daesh publication as evidence towards an incitement argument. And all of that is, is open source. That's all fine. Where it gets interesting in terms of things like the Berkeley Protocol and introducing better standards for not just not just authentication and verification, but collection, right? It all starts at a point of collection. And it's not just about open source intelligence in some, in some sort of broad 
intelligence-y sort of way, but there's a much more forensic and legal, uh, legally compliant approach to doing this that has, that has really, I think, developed significantly probably over the last decade um, and is, 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 is kind of heavily part of the process now. We're talking about digital forensics more than open source intelligence. Um, and that, that applies to the physical media and extracting information in a way that is sound and will you know, uh, preserve the admissibil admissibility of the physical object as well as the information contained in it, uh, as well as going online and, and, and acquiring and, and collecting material to that, that sort of standard. So I, I, I'd say in terms of expanding the, the realm of, or the range of case studies, uh, of organizations that are bringing these kinds of methods on board, definitely look to those other mechanisms. Um, there's a lot going on and it's, it's done, being done to a pretty, pretty high standard. So again, question is, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that, if any? I think you're, you're muted, Nikki. Oh, I think it's okay. I think I'm off mute. Um, Eva, I'll pass to you. Um, yep. And we, we can have um, one minute each from, from James and Lena. Sure. So let me first just continue to what James was uh, saying about this idea of the expert as an officer of the court. I was just recently at an event, the Historical Dialogues Conference in Amsterdam, and Christian Axbo Nielsen, who is a historian based in Denmark, was also making the, very much the same point. He was testifying about the Bosnian Serb police and also in other cases um, in, in some domestic jurisdictions in, in Germany and Canada, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So Vladimir Petrovic is another historian who is also thinking about this. So I think it's, it's really on, on kind of the radar of uh, uh, numerous uh, people in, in different places. In relation to the final uh, briefs, uh, uh, James uh, very much answered it uh, uh, correctly. I would say there's also a pre-trial brief. It's kind of a, a, a pre-trial, as, as the name says, this is well, how we're going to be arguing our case, but the final brief is actually the consolidated story after the entire process has rolled. If the, if the defense decides, you know what, this prosecution argument is just, well, we're not going to spend time on that. So it's kind of the consolidated, okay, this is our best case. That's why I think it's the beginning. And I, as a historian, don't only look into the text, I actually look at the footnotes. And then I trace those in the, uh, in the databases that the um, ICTY and the RMCT is, is putting uh, kind of uh, uh, out there. Um, and just finally, uh, uh, on this question of um, paths not taken in, in strategies, I think this is uh, uh, very, very interesting. And this is something that I would like to look into also in the future as this research proceeds. I also would like to ask the question, how free are they to choose a story? Because these defendants are often dependent on states. States have interest. States may give you money, but may say, listen, <laughs> nudge, nudge, this is the story that we would like you to tell. So, I mean, at this stage, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's something that I kind of know of sort of anecdotally, and I'm not sure how openly or, or uh, uh, sort of how, how much one can get a substantiated evidence, but it, it, it's, I, I would say that the assumption that there is complete freedom to argue your case in these cases that imply state, in, you know, state involvement, state institutions are maybe not as free as 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 we would uh, uh, think. So I would love to to kind of continue on that and, may, and maybe see where um, uh, where it leads. Yes, that was it for me. Shall I go over on mic? Yep. Uh, yes to all Mike's questions uh, uh, and uh, an extra bit on the digital forensics since that was mentioned. Uh, I, I, I recommend without remembering exactly what it was a chapter that I co-authored with Maziar Hunem and Gina Rudraka. Excuse my Persian and uh, Richard Overall in the Warlord Technology book that we edited. Uh, challenges ahead, uh, but ways of doing things. But the evidence will need to be the right kind. Much of the digital evidence won't be the right kind. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I feel like that's a good segue into my final comments as well, because on documentary evidence, uh, I actually had a very difficult time at first on how to legally classify document uh, open source evidence, whether it's a form of real evidence of a crime or documentary evidence. 
um, as the, the rules governing admissibility will, will, will change depending on, on how it's classified. And while international experts have treated it as documentary evidence, there's no guidance in, uh, in English law on, on what kind of evidence it is. However, I've gone with documentary for now. Um, and then pivoting back to Michael, um, so as I, I mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, I worked with uh, the Center of Information Resilience, which actually worked on the Myanmar Witness uh, project that you're talking about um, with Benjamin Strick, uh, who was leading that on, as you mentioned, um, they're doing an excellent work in, in collecting, you know, uh, videos of, of these crimes that are happening, you know, state violence against civilians in Myanmar. Uh, in real time and creating kind of heat maps and times of, of, and geolocation of, of when and where these, these, uh, these instances of violence are taking place, which, uh, which will be incredibly value and valuable in a future accountability mechanism, which one so far, I mean, I'm, you know, as I mentioned, there's, there is an enormous amount of amazing work that is being done, but without knowing in what jurisdiction it's going to be used in. Um, so, I'm really raising the question of, uh, of, of how, how we're going to be assessing it in, in England and Wales if we have the, you know, the opportunity to have a war criminal on, uh, in our jurisdiction, are we going to be able to use this kind of evidence to, uh, to, to bring them to justice? And um, uh, yeah, so <laughs> but I agree, there's, there's incredible work being done. your hand up, but I, I also noticed that we're now at time. Um, so uh, may, do you want me to hand to you and you can add your, your final comment there and then and then close for us to go to lunch? Um. Sure, I, I, I can. I, I just wanted to um, jump in and, and sympathize with, uh, with, with Lena. I, I've had exactly the same kind of problem. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's a problem, just more of an intellectual challenge in trying to understand degrees or, or, or I guess degrees of proximity of a document to the original event. As historians, we're used to dealing with this in terms of primary, secondary, tertiary. In legal terms, you've got, you know, the real evidence, and then you need to sort of figure out, you know, what, what do we mean by primary, primary documentary evidence, this is secondary documentary evidence in text, especially when some of that might actually be real evidence committed or, or generated within the context of the, the commission of the crime. So, I mean, those, I, as a non-lawyer, I would say that those are always judgment calls that are gonna, you know, come into play. Um, but it's a really interesting exercise and it's, it's not one that, you know, there, there's some literature on it, uh, but, but it's, it's an area that, that uh, requires work and I, I feel kind of privileged to be trying to test it, um, you know, in the field as it were, and I'm looking forward to, writing it up in some way and trying to puzzle puzzle through that in relation to maybe some specific cases uh, as opposed to just you know sort of abstract stuff that's it for me sorry i didn't mean to take your space uh, nikki it's your panel i'll leave it to you to close james thank you lena um i've really enjoyed the discussion huge food for thought um and thank you also to all of the participants and and the other panelists um and obviously to to joe and mike for for bringing us all together all right well i think it's now a lunch break if i'm looking at the um, program correctly and then we're all coming back again together in an hour's time at 1 30 where we'll be looking at cases in access the very timely um, case studies of Ukraine and Colombia. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Nikki. Thank Thanks. Thank panel. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Fascinating. We will um, we'll leave the uh, Zoom call on, uh, but feel free to just um, stop your videos and, and, and mute. Until then, I'll be doing the same thing. <laughs>